today I'm going to be cold packing sweet potatoes, which I've done tons of times and I have proven that it's effectively and it works great for long storage. Into this video also, I will be giving tips that I have learned uh, doing sweet potatoes and canning in itself. Into my playlist, I also have a video for hot packing method. Now, USDA says that we are to uh, steam or boil our potatoes for 15 to 20 minutes. I have found out no matter what type of potato I use, if I do that, they come out to be mush. And that's not what I'm interested in too, because time you can, time you do that and you can them, they're mush. So my regular potatoes, when I do hot packing, I only do it for two or three minutes. I've never had any problems. But today, like I said, we're going to be, be cold packing uh, sweet potatoes. Therefore, we're going to be eliminating that process. So, but come along with me and let me show you how I have changed my method in cold packing, hot packing sweet potatoes. So the first thing I do is I wash my potatoes. Um, I have them washed. They're all dried out. I usually wash them the night before. So they'll just be all dried out. It seems to make um, these peelings come up a lot easier. But you notice on these potatoes, there is some like brown spots. And these brown spots come from too much rain. There are too much rain. Um, these potatoes right here are 100 days old. Potatoes harvest is usually around 120 days or so. That it, this is what it looks like. Now what happens is, is that um, the potatoes peeling start toughening up. They won't be good for long storage. So sweet potatoes need to be canned at least one or two months after harvest. When you wash your potatoes, they actually look worse than this, the darkness onto it. But I just take a little scrub brush and I get all the dirt off because that's helping cleaning these potatoes so I can get ready for peeling. So let me show you my new method on how I make it easy as far as uh, peeling these potatoes. Anybody that's uh, ever canned potatoes knows that it can be a long, um, tiring process. Uh, potatoes are hard to cut, so into this video I will show you my new method that made it simple and easy, and I'm so excited about that. But I'm also going to show you, we're fixing to go over there, show you where I relax and peel these potatoes and it doesn't wear me out by the end of the canning process. So over here, I already have my peeler ready, I have a knife ready, and I'm relaxed, I have a remote control, and usually I have the TV on. So the first process, I'll just go ahead and start peeling these potatoes. Now, obviously you will notice there's a towel onto the floor. The reason that towel is, I don't have to worry about these peelings going all over the place. If I have this situated right, then whatever peelings goes outside this pan is going to go onto the towel and it's going to make a very easy um, cleanup. Not only that, uh, potato peelings have a tendency to have like a tar substance that will darken your hands and make it really sticky. And uh, so I'll give you that tip on how I get that off my hands because usually by the time I finish peeling potatoes, my hands are pretty black and sticky. And not soap and soap and water is not going to take it off. So making it easy, like I said, I got the TV on and I'm just going to town at this. I'm not concerned as much as all imperfection. I'll do that in my next step. I have canned potatoes many times and, you know, standing up on the floor, constantly, you know, doing this and all day long, it can be very, very tiring. Not only that, the, you can't really, whoops, go like I'm going. Because, you know, when you're doing this, these potato peels have a tendency to go everywhere. But with this big canner pot here, they uh, go basically right into the pot. And then they'll go right into the garden. Or they go back into the ground um, to fertilize it. No waste here onto the homestead. Now, while I'm doing this, you know, some of the imperfections I'll cut out. This potato wasn't bad. But I've never grown potatoes. I had all perfect potatoes. 
So many times I see videos and are all perfect. Well, I've never had all perfect potatoes. So you just go out and uh, go and just cut all the imperfections out. Here's my water. Here's a smaller one. I'm gonna cut the end of it off. And yes, you can use smaller potatoes. These are good for, um, you know, stir fries are good for making air fry. Air frying, I did some yesterday, and you know, with these potatoes, I didn't have to put any sugar, any you know, anything on. They was just, just literally delicious. So what I do is I cut my potato up, and um, then I put it uh, in a bowl. Uh, cut my potatoes. I have a commercial potato uh, French fry cutter, and then I put it in, put them in a bowl, and I uh, put some olive oil. I take my fork or spoon, and I just mix it up, and then I put them into the air fryer. So the, some imperfections I'll get off. Now this potato right here um, is where the uh, uh, little potato fork hit it. You're going to have some damage at times. Most of the time you'll go ahead and, and you know, use those first. I didn't get to it. Because of that, they usually don't store very long. But this one has stored pretty good. These potatoes have definitely been... Um, harvested at a month and so that imperfection I'm just going to cut out now one of the things I do is that when I'm getting my imperfections out I got my knife slanted I use my thumb as a guideline and I'm guiding it around to cut out that imperfection so that'll go in there and then any other imperfections We'll do the same way. Now this smaller imperfection right here is a little bit deeper. Once again, I'm going to just take my hand. I'm going to go around into a circle. And I'm pretty much going to hew that out. So also, you'll take notice later on as the air hits this. Sometimes it this is creating a bruising. You go into this, the second stage I'll show you. And then you'll kind of just take you know any imperfections out of your potato. Sometimes you'll see little diblets there. And then you'll continue on peeling your potatoes. See how fast this is? It's no stress. You're not worn slam out. You get to watch TV. You know, you can look up at it. Um, now, in my area, I have it set that when I'm in the kitchen, I can still see the TV. But standing up constantly, you know, you got potatoes to peel. You're in the canning can really, uh, it's, it's work. It, it can it can take it out of you. So I'll go through and just take off some of the, most of the infections I see now. Because like I said, once the air hits this, more will show up. Because most of these imperfections are just skin deep. So here we have one that's really pitted. It's really, it's what it does is that the potato grows... And uh, say we have a drought and then suddenly we get rain, it takes off growing, it creates these little slits right here because it's growing so fast. Like I said, I've never had perfect potatoes on here. I believe these might be ant bites, but don't throw your potato away just because it doesn't look good on the outside. You can salvage this potato. So here you'll see where I hit it with the potato fork. And so we're just going to go through this process and get these imperfections out really this is uh, so much faster to me than trying to stand up and having these peelings going all over the place all over the floor all over the counter and you know usually i'll do it in the sink but they're still because i have a deep sink and it's there they're still going um places with the towel down here i can uh, easily pick it up once i'm done um, periodically as I'm peeling my potatoes then uh, I will take it and just shake it outside and bring it back in so now we see that we got all these imperfections taking place in this potato right here so we can salvage this potato I'm just going to take our paring knife and we're going to go through guidance of our thumb, slanting of the knife, 
and we're going to get it out and there we go now in these pits at times especially if you have a, a deep one dirt will get in there um so you'll have that sometimes you'll have to take and go and wash your potato off i've had that where it just split Now your potato is going to look really hewed out, but you have to get all, you need to get all these um, imperfections out. You don't want to put this into your jar. I mean, you can create some um, botulism, I think that's how you say it. Not pretty, but it will work. So if you agree with me that doing it this way is simpler, um, you know, stressless, you know, cleanup is easy. Give me a thumbs up. This is nothing I've seen anybody do. This is my own invention because I do have some back issues. And uh, by the end of the day, my back is hurting. Standing on my feet all day long, doing whatever I need to take care of. And at the end of the day, my back is hurting. I'm more slab out. Um, is it worth it? Yeah, it's, it's worth it when I eat good, healthy uh, food that doesn't have all the chemicals, food that I have grown, food that tastes better than anything at the grocery store, food I'm not worried about having Roundup on. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, I believe it's the way to go. It doesn't take very long to do this easy either because I've got my arm right here, I'm resting it, and I'm working with my other hand. And just It just makes life so much easier when it comes to doing potatoes. But this is basically just to speed this process up, get these potatoes peeled. Um, already I'm starting to feel the stickiness. I'm starting to see my hands turn and I'm going to show you a tip that I learned on my own how to get this off because soap and water is not going to take it off. And everything you touch, this is going to go on to. So you got to get this off before you go through the next process. Um, so, I'm okay. So this is where I'm going to do my, my second phase of potatoes. Um, I did make a video um, how I got the stain off my hands and I didn't have any sound. So to refresh that, what we're going to do is just kind of redo it. Just pretend that my hands are all stained up um very very stained up you still see a little bit of staining because i've been um peeling potatoes for a while but what i use is vitamin e oil i take the vitamin e oil and i just put a little dab on there and i rub my hands this takes that um sticky uh tar like substance on my hands off and uh because if you don't everything you touch is going to what you touch then i'm going to take some just some uh, this detergent and I'm washing my hands and it instantly comes off. You might not get all the stains off but most of the time you will. It depends on how long you've been peeling. And then you just take your towel, wipe your hand, dry your hands off and as you're drying the, the stain starts coming off. The more you wipe the more that stain uh, comes off. It depends on you know how long you've been peeling potatoes, how thick that uh, tar-like substance is on your hands. So if you're blanching your potatoes, as FDA says, for 15 or 20 minutes, you're going to have that tar-like substance around your pot at the top. Um, even if you do it with lots of potatoes, you're going to have that tar-like substance around the top of your pot. So what you could do is you could take olive oil and smear it around the top where that tar-like substance is at. If you don't do that, if you don't use olive oil and you just try to take a little scrubber and some dish detergent, it's, you're going to be hours there trying to get that tar-like substance off. But if you use olive oil, smear it around the top, take one of these copper type um, scrubbers here. I cut mine in half. That's why it looks so raggedy. And uh, so and you scrub it, it'll come right off. So this is a tip that I like to share with you because, you know, it's nothing like scrubbing a pot and just really not getting anywhere and then having your hands all stained up. So our next step here is to take these potatoes 
and we're going to go through them we're going to look at them see if we can see any imperfections on the potatoes cut them out uh take the the peeler you know i have my peeler ready i have my knife ready and we're washing them off and then we're ready to take them over there so they can be uh cut into pieces i like to do the mouth size size pieces type you can pick up the fork and eat um but I, I want to show you uh, a super great item that I picked up at an antique, uh, well it was actually they own an antique store, but it was at the Homestead Conference in Rocky Point, North Carolina on the southeast coast. And it was our first conference and it was really super great because it was like 15 minutes from my home and that was even awesome. And this was the item that I had in mind to make to see if it could help me out, but I just hadn't gotten to it. It's not an item that what it was built to do, but for these potatoes, it works perfectly. And it's definitely something other that you can make to make cutting and peeling potatoes a simple and easy and not a hard, a lot of hard work. So this is my hot new item. Picked it up from a guy that has an antique store. It's uh, ranging from the age of 18, early 1800s, I do believe. Um, when I was growing up, and I have some of these knives um, that came from my mother. I'm pretty sure they came from my grandmother because everything back then was passed down. People just didn't go out and buy things, so they didn't have the money. And uh, so they were called butchering knives. This is a handmade item here, uh, whether they made it and sold it but it's been used many 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 times because i can see the grooves into it this is actually a cheese cutter it's made with uh, two pieces of metal like a rainbow shape uh, l shape at each corner here with screws into it on the bottom it has pegs making it as a table we'll notice here that this is obviously a newer one and this it looks like the originals here. This one right here is just a piece of wood. It looks like it's been cut out, whittled out, and uh, it's, it, you can look at the wood and just tell it's really super old. Um, so it's a little bit uneven. It has been used many times. I'm thinking about uh, taking a piece of slim piece of wood and put it in there, you know, and see if it keeps it from cutting down any more because this is a great great uh, piece of tool to have into your but kitchen here. Basically, I'm going to be taking my potatoes and watch how simple this is. Now, everybody that's ever done potatoes knows how hard it is to cut these potatoes. It's just super hard. Now, I like to get my potatoes in different sizes. Basically the same, but not completely the same. And I'm telling you, this thing is the bomb. You could definitely make one of these. You can take it like a machete knife or something other, or if you got a knife. Um, I don't know if he sharpened this up before he sold it or what, but he did tell me that he had it sitting on his table, and then his grandchild was coming along, and he didn't want it, you know, in in the area. So I was very thankful to get a hold of this because this has made my my. Uh, cold packing potatoes very successful and easy to do so if we if we take say this smaller one here it's it's definitely hard hard to cut into and then you take a chance of cutting your fingers it's really super hard but with this watch this is that easy or what So I have my bowl of water over here, and I just keep doing this. So if you do potatoes, any type of potatoes, this will be your go-to tool. You make cheese. Now I try not to slam it down for the fact of the blade keep cutting into the wood. I try to be easy with it. Smaller potatoes. Depends on the size they are, I'll just keep them about the same. Um, if I'm using quart jars, it uh, 
you know, I like my pieces bigger. I just like them where I can pick them up with a fork. Because these potatoes are just, they're just sweet. I could not have done this in the amount of time. I'm cutting these pieces a little big, but since I will be doing um, quarts, then I definitely want my potatoes a little bit bigger. Um, pints are easy to situate into the jar. Of course, you don't get that many, but they're great for a you know a serving. It depends on uh, you know how much you eat. It could be two people serving. This is this is just fast. I'm just so thankful for this item here. I'm so glad that I that the Lord was uh, set me up to find this item. I mean, I was going to the Homestead Conference and I stopped at the first vendor and the first vendor had this and I saw it. You know, I had we just had the second um, Homestead Conference, Fall Conference, Fall Festival, and uh, I had to ask him what he told me because all my mind could think was potatoes. And he told me it was a cheese cutter. And I do believe he said it was like in the eight, early 1800s. So I'm going to continue on cutting these potatoes right here. Um, this little curve right here is really neat so you can reach down there. It's not in your way. Um, if you slice some cheese, then you could like put your hand there. Now when it comes to making your syrup, um, everybody does a little bit differently. Um, but the basic recipe is... If, we got one quart of water to one cup of sugar, one quart of water to two cups of sugar, and then one quart of water to three cups of sugar. That's your light, your medium, and your heavy. Now, I do mine a little bit differently. I like to make a heavy batch. When I say a heavy batch, I like to make a, a big batch, should I say. And I've already got four quarts of, of water in there. This is six. That way I don't have to stop in the middle canning and make more syrup. Because I know that once this batch is over, then I'm going to be doing another one. So with me, I end up using six cups of water. Oh, excuse me, six quarts of water. Get this right now. Six quarts of water and three cups of sugar. I've already got the heat going here. And you want to keep this, you know, you want to watch it, keep it stirred. It doesn't take very long for this syrup to melt. I'm just going to get it very hot so that it'll be ready to pour into my jars. But I like doing it this way because if you're doing your jars and then you say you got, uh, you're on your last jar and you're missing maybe a, a fourth of a cup of syrup, then you got to stop and you got to go through this process. But if you go ahead and make a double batch, a heavy batch, I call it heavy batch, but a double batch, then you don't have to worry about that because later all I got to do is put my lid on there, you know, and then when I'm ready for my next a batch to put into my jars. All I got to do is heat it up and I'm ready to go. I'm going to keep this uh, stirred. But yeah, I use uh, six quarts of water and three cups of sugar. At the same time, I got my canner over here. Now I got it set on six. This water is uh, starting to steam a little bit. It's going to be just about the same temperature. So when I pour this syrup into my jars, then I'm going to take my jars and place them into my canner. You don't want to take your jars of hot syrup and then put it into a canner that's got cold water because you're going to take a chance of busting your jars. So I'm going to turn this down a little bit because it's been going before this syrup's going. And it will not take very long for this syrup. And we're going to go over there and start filling these jars. So what I got going on here is I've got my vinegar there. I like to use vinegar to wipe the rims of my jars. To, to, you know, to, it cuts that uh, syrup or any, you know, get the, any kind of food particles off the top of my jars. It, to me, it also helps to seal these jars because it's clean. I also have my um, chopstick that I help to debubble. I've got my knife ready. 
so that if I see any in, more imperfections in here, as I'm doing this, I'll look and cut them out, get them out of the way. Now, filling these jars is really simple. Why my mouth jars, which I did use for my pints, it's really a lot easier. I, I tried to switch more to wide mouth. They're easier to clean, easier to fill. Um, to begin with, what I do is I just take my potatoes and I'm just kind of letting them drop in there and, and they kind of find their place. When I get a certain amount in there, what I do with all my potatoes, and I always set a jar right there so I can put this on top of it because of water, but I kind of shake them like that and it, they situate themselves. Another time I'll like for just regular potatoes, I'll put some water in there and it helps these potatoes to get situated. So I'm just going to fill it up and look at my potatoes and see how they're situating. When it comes to potatoes, you can kind of help them get situated. When the surf is ready, um, when the surf is ready, then we'll, we'll fill the jar. So if my surf was already ready, then I, my next step would just take it over there to the pot and start filling it up. Now, one of the things I have learned is that I don't fill my potatoes all the way up to the rim. I like to keep to keep them further down. It gives me more space. I'm not packing this in there. Um, I'm just I'm, I'm I'm not packing it in there. I'm just putting them into the jars. So while the syrup is getting ready, we're going to continue filling these jars. I really like with the regular mouth, I kind of like start out with this. It just helps it to fall right in there. Look at my potatoes. As it gets closer to the top, most of the time I'll end up taking that off. always looking at my potatoes to see if I could just place them in there. It makes it easier for me. Faster, easier. It seems like I'm wasting space, but um, some of this is going to, um, your surface is going to, you know, some of the water is going to come out as it's processing. So I like to try as much as I can, I can't control it, but I like as much as I can to keep my vegetable covered with the liquid. So I'm going to step over here and I'm going to stir that syrup. So as we can see, it's already starting to steam, it takes no time. So this right here is definitely steaming. The canner is steaming. I don't let this come to a rapid boil. The sugar is already melted. And uh, so it's just about ready. We're just going to step over there. And we're going to continue filling the jars. And then we're going to put the syrup into the jars. Now, as the syrup is being placed in here, it's going gonna, it's gonna to create these potatoes to rise. And they'll start moving around and get sit, more situated. So, we are now ready to fill our jars. Now, what I like to do, I, I, this is your one inch mark around that little ring right there at the top. Um, I like to go just a little bit above it because I'm, when I debubble this, some of this liquid is going to um, go down. So, usually I just take my measuring cup, it's the easiest, and I just feel it. I have to be careful because this is hot syrup. These jars, um, when this uh, potatoes are in here, um, this hot syrup is going to start cooking them. This is also known a method as raw packing. Raw packing, cold packing, and usually I like to do um, with one jar at a time and put it right into the canner. 
Whoops. But because, um, you know, I had to make my syrup, that kind of put things uh, out of order that I like to, to do it in. But if you're just starting out and you, this is, you know, your first batch, this is probably what you're going to go through. Our next step is to debubble. I can already tell that some of this liquid has already gone down, but we're going to debubble. We're never trying to pack these potatoes in here. And while I'm debubbling, I see air bubbles rising. Debubble it, and while we're debubbling it, these potatoes have a tendency to get even more situated. A lot of times I'll hold some of these potatoes down. They want to pop out. I'll just hold it the top. I'm not holding them down. I'm just kind of put my finger on top of them. You always want to debubble. And then I'm trying to situate these a little bit just so they'll be up under that syrup. I have my vinegar here and um, just a paper towel. You want to wipe this rim really good. And then we're going to be ready to put our lid, our flap on, our lid on. These will be clean, sterilized, and USDA in the old recipe book says firmly tighten. And that helps me out a lot because a lot of times, a lot of times, you know, people just say, I've done it, say finger tight. Well, what in the world is finger tight? You know, because everybody's strength is different. What is what is finger tight? So, uh, and it, it it always left a question mark for me. Now that I've opened up that cookbook that I've had for years and looked at it, then now I know really what to do. I'm not I'm never questioning it anymore. Um, if the liquid falls down further than that line, I'll just add a little bit more. That's why I try to add a little bit more because it hits it perfect. So, wiping the, the, the ring off, the, your top off, top of your jar, put your lid on, your flap, your ring. And back in the day, I was like, what is finger tight? So, I, would, I do like that, right? But it, I always worried. And... Um, I've never had any failures with that. I mean, every now and then you'll have a lid that doesn't seal, and you know it could be the lid, it could be the lid, it could be the ring, it could be the jar, it could be product got up under the the lid. But to make it easy for me, that's it. I just do it like that. I don't over tighten it. I just do it like that. And so these are going into the canner. And they will be processed at 11 pounds of pressure. And you have to know in your area, from zero, I believe it's a thousand um, feet, is uh, 11 pounds, um, 10 pounds of pressure. You've got to look up your PSI for your area. Higher up is a different PSI. So I will continue filling these jars and uh, then we'll, we'll get them all into the canner and we'll take the next step. Hot. Reason I'm taking those two out because it has rose up, and I'm just trying to make sure that I got. I, I like my surf as much as possible over my potatoes. So now we have all our jars into the canner and we're going to put the lid on. Now this is a, a this canner is a All American N95. I also have a Presto. I used to use it all the time. And both canners uh, cook, or they say cook differently. They um, kind of operate a little bit differently. As you can see, I have these knobs on here. Um, one of the things I like to do is when I untighten it, try to keep the the uh, knobs the knobs um, basically. You know, when I to undo it, when I undo it, I kind of keep it basically the same. That helps me out to keep this level. 
because if you have one side higher than the other then you're going to be then steam out and it's you're, you're just not going to have any pressure or much pressure and it's going to take longer and it's going to take out your water so one of the things i do um I'm trying to look and see i always look around the edges to see where um i'm trying to see with the camera but um see where see how level it is but if i keep these knobs basically you know don't unscrew them too far then i can put it up like that and i can i can pretty much basically have it level i always look around on my counter the reason i'm telling you that because um i guess with many many uses 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 um maybe the canner wears a little bit but um i have two times before uh, noticed that it wasn't kept keeping the PSI it wasn't going like it was supposed to I started looking and steam was coming out and I had to stop it so from now on I just take and try not to unscrew these so far and that way I can get them back up back up for my next canning session basically be right I look around on all sides to see if it's level then I kind of tighten a little bit one side to the other And then I give it a, on one side to the other, give it a good tighten. Make sure I got this right. Got all of them. All right. So my next step is I'm turning this up on high. What's going to happen? This pressure is going to build. Over here at this vent right here, the vent is going to start more and more producing steam. I want this steam to come out. When this steam, I see the steam coming out, then I'm going to set my timer for 10 minutes. You want it to vent for 10 minutes before you put your weight on. Now I'll be going up with 10 pounds of pressure. So that's why you need to know your PSI. So you'll know whether you need to go 10 pounds or 15 pounds. It all depends on your area. So now we just got to wait. It won't take very long, maybe 10 minutes. And uh, for this pressure to start coming out, we'll put the weight on, like I said. Um, what's going to happen is once we put that weight on, this pressure is going to continue building here. And um, for sweet potatoes, this is 11 pounds of pressure. Don't be too alarmed. This is where you really watch it at. You can't be walking away. You can't be distracted. Um, you really got to stay focused here. If this PSI goes up, most time when I'm doing sweet potatoes for some reason, uh, even though they say 11 pounds of pressure, it ends up going to 12 pounds of pressure. I'm not concerned with it. I try to cut it down. I keep watching it. One of the things that helps me out is that once this starts venting, so I won't get distracted and get busy and forget about it or whatever the case may be, because you, you, you can do it and get your mind on something else. Once, once this vents for 10 minutes and I, my timer has gone off, I'll leave my timer on. The timer will go off every, I think it's probably about it, at least every minute, minute and a half. And that keeps me focused on my canner because it's very easy to get over there and start doing more potatoes and the PSI goes up. These are very safe can, uh, canners. Most of the time when I have the weight on, if it gets too high, it will start jiggling. Um, also notice with my canner, once it gets to probably about eight pounds of pressure, uh, it makes a little pop and that catches my attention. But... For me, I always just, once this starts bending, I just leave that timer on because that little alarm lets me, it reminds me, lets me stay focused. Hey, this canner is building pressure. Now, the canners are very safe. Um, I've only, I've got three, I got two All-Americans and one Presto. And uh, you do have to, on the Presto, you have to change the gaskets periodically. They, you know, have so many cannings for long canning pretty much, but I um, only had, um, I think it was this one. It might have been my Presto, but there's a, let me see, there was a little gasket. Is it one here? This is your vent. There's a little gasket here on the Presto. It has a gasket in the middle. Um, so when this wore out, this little gasket back here, it just, I heard this pop. Um, it didn't make a mess or anything. The gasket just blew out. The pressure drops. And of course, the cannon had to start, the cannon, if you lose your pressure, uh, your PSI dropped. You got to start that canning process all the way over again. But it was it was no fear. It was just that the gasket here it could have been defect. It could have just gotten so worn 
that it just popped out. So don't be so um, intimidated about canning. Canning uh, these days and time is, is pretty simple. Once you start, you, you really just can't stop. It's, it's just amazing. You just got to learn the basics. Follow your manual um, according to its instructions. I have uh, in here with the water, I have two quarts of water. So I have a pitcher that holds two quarts of water. I just fill it up and I pour it in there. I put a little bit of vinegar in there because I'm on well water and to, to break the minerals down and grease or whatever, you know, depends on what I'm cooking, uh, processing and uh, grease, uh, oils, you know, um, whatever it may be to break, help break that down. So now we're just going to wait with this uh, canner here to build its pressure and start venting to put our weight on. And then after that, we'll be well on our way. So while that is building pressure, waiting for the, this to vent, um, we must know that for pints, it's going to take 65 minutes. For quarts, it's going to take 90 minutes. If your pressure drops in the process of you processing your food, then you're gonna to have to start it all over again. You can't sit there and say, okay, let me jump the heat up and uh, you know turn it on high and get that pressure up and continue on with the timing of your process. That is a no-no. You have to start it all over again. So even if, God forbid, if you've got 20 more minutes left on your timer, as far as your food being processed and that pressure drops whether you didn't watch it or somehow reason another the pressure drop and you got to start that process all over again so if you was doing pints and the pressure drops and pints go for 65 minutes then you got to start the timer all over again for 65 minutes and the same as with quarts quarts 90 minutes pints 65 minutes can't be no cheating on this because we're talking about safe food and so canning is very simple you just got to follow the guidelines the the most important guidelines the processing time how to prepare the food um raw packing sweet potatoes uh, i i love this like i said i've done it tons of times i don't have any problems with it i do my regular potatoes like this and i'll probably continue doing it when i've done it both ways um, with regular potatoes, uh, the blanching helps out a little bit with um, starch, but um, you know I, I really never had any problems. Usually, when I have take my potatoes, my white potatoes out of a jar, say if I was going to make hash browns or just use those potatoes into soup or whatever I'm going to use it for, then I wash those potatoes off. I wash all that starch off and. Uh, and most of the time, I don't even use the liquid. Um, you can if you're making vegetable soup. I've never had any problem, but definitely follow the cooking guidelines. You can't, you can't, you can't cheat on it. You, you just can't. Processing time is very crucial and very important. I'm already starting to see a little bit of bubbling coming out. A lot of times, I lay my hand over this. I'm feeling some heat coming out, so it won't be very long before we have a good. Uh, set of steam coming out of here and it's getting to a point so hot I can't hold my hand there very long okay let me start over so I noticed the pressure has risen up I can feel the pressure I can hear the pressure I've set my timer for 10 minutes I'm going to let this vent for 10 minutes in the meantime we are going to go um, take a look in the pantry of where I store my rings I got my weight sitting here ready because I'm going to be putting it on 10 pounds of pressure. I always double check that make sure I'm putting it on the, the right one, not 5, not 15, but 10. And once that 10 minutes goes off, we'll put that weight on, 10 pounds of pressure, and do a watch this rise up to 11 pounds of pressure. Okay, so this is my, my pantry room. Um, so here is here is, and it's got a lot of rings on it. Here is where I just took a clothes hanger. I've hooked it on there. And I made it into a J. So when I need rings, all I got to do is come in here and get rings. 
when I wash my rings, this one went on the wrong one. When I wash, no, it didn't. Um, this is my large wide mouth um, rings, and this is my regular mouth rings. When I need rings, I just come in here and get them. When I wash them, of course, you see it's loaded up right there. Um, then I just been able to, I'm able to come in here, just you know, put them there and get them. I have my jars sitting here, so when I need jars, I, I, I'm just right here at it. Now, one of the things I do is that, like, usually I don't have this many rings on here because when more jars you use, the more rings you're going to have. So let me show you what I do to store these rings. And these are just cheap, basic, duty file. Uh, you know, you put your file, filing papers in there, folders, just a, a file box uh, and you can put your rings in there. I like to put my regulars in one box. I like to put my wild mouth in another box and I have them in a separate area. So while that is bending, I'm getting ready for my le my next canning session. Uh, these are was canned yesterday and uh, sometimes the lids don't want to come off easy. So what I'm going to be doing with these is, you know, wash them off because they got syrup on them. The hot water helps loosen those rings because they're stuck on there. If they stay stuck on there, sometimes I'll just leave them out. But with this syrup, they can really get stuck on there. And I always like run hot water over it, run up under the hot water. Same time, just get the syrup off. And it takes it off. So if you're having a hard time getting your rings off, just run it up under hot water and there you have it so now all we're going to do is take a rag and in with some i like to take some dish of uh, soap and wash the syrup off and then i'll take a uh a clean towel kitchen towel and dry these off and then they'll be ready for um storage. I'll, I'll put them back into the boxes that came in. Um, I also, it depends on the product. I can tell those are sweet potatoes, so I'm not worried about putting sweet potatoes on there. Um, if anybody was, if I wasn't here, somebody was to taste them, then they will taste them and see they were sweet potatoes. But putting a date on these is uh, very important so that my older potatoes uh, are eaten first and the newer potatoes are last. Um, I try to grow potatoes, sweet potatoes every year. I love it. Um, using the pints, uh, it's very beneficiary because you can either go through this in one process of eating or maybe two if you have a couple. So you're only opening up one jar at a time. Another tip that I have is that once you wash your rings, and I, I kind of let them drip off a little bit, but I actually sold my older lids thinking I was, for some reason, doing a wise thing. We know the older stuff is made better. I have noticed that my rings, sometimes even sitting on these jars, will start to rust. And But once I get these cleaned up, I make sure, and I let them drip off a little bit of the water, I make sure that I clean them very well. Um, not clean them, but dry them very well because they're already supposed to be clean. So, and then this helps also if any food particles have got, you know, left on there. But be sure, be sure not to leave your rings onto your jars because you want a false seal. Um, if the rings are left on there, it can create that pressure to stay there and it can be a false seal. But um, also just make sure that, um, and it's going to, it can rust, create your rings to rust. Make sure, make sure that you take these and, um, let them air dry, um, towel dry them off, and then let them air dry. Sometimes I put them up in the seal fan because I've found that they start rusting. Um, so my timer has gone off. Bending really good. Timer's gone off. Then I'm going to look at my weight. Make sure I'm putting it on 10 pounds of pressure. Now, what I'm going to be doing here, I'm leaving my timer on because that's going to alarm me that, you know, keep my attention on this uh, canner here. So I'm going to wait for this, this gauge up here to go up to 11 pounds of pressure. And 
I'm going to wait. And we're going to wait until it reaches that 11 pounds of pressure. But once again, you know, I would just advise to leave the timer on. Um, I know the camera's got my head cut off, but, <laughs> but leave the timer on so that you can stay focused that you need to not let this pressure build too high. While we're waiting on that, I'm drying my jars. Now, how long does it take me to eat these potatoes? Well, not very long. I've already ate two quarts in two days. And uh, these are pints, so it doesn't take very long. It's not like you're storing up a whole lot. Um, give some to family and friends and you eat. Uh, I don't go to the grocery store and buy stuff. I try as much as possible to grow because I don't like all the chemicals. I don't like what they do these days. And I know what's going into my food. Uh, I know what's not going into my food. And uh, so they, they spray a lot of stuff, just like on um, potatoes, they'll spray a chemical that creates it not to sprout. Some of my potatoes already started sprouting. And so they'll spray that and they'll be, they'll be months old. I mean, they, they'll be old. They got so many preservatives on it. How do I open up these potatoes? So usually I'll just take a butter knife and I'll take my jar and I'll pry that lid off. Sometimes it's harder than other times. So let's give a little taste test here and see how you see how well they're they're, they're um, holding together. They're not falling apart. They're not mushy. Mm. Ah. Oh, I forgot it was on camera. Mm. Super delicious. You can make desserts. Um, eat them out of the jar. No power, no problem. These are very healthy for your body. I believe they got a lot of antioxidants. If I'm saying that right. A lot of vitamins and stuff. You see how fast this jar is going. So, the canner is still... Um, the timer's still going. I've still got it going, reminding me. In the meantime, I'm taking a break. But look. You can use these in pies, casseroles. Whenever I open up a jar, then it makes me think how well worth it is to take my time to do what I do. I tell you because I want you to do it for yourself and then you'll say, gosh, you know, um, this is a lot better. A little bit of time and effort, but it's a lot better. It's a way of living. Look, I almost ate this whole jar. Since I've been canning, I haven't um, um, stopped to eat yet. So not very long, this jar will be gone. Whenever I'm making my batches, I always like, see I keep looking at that canner, I always like to do a taste test to see if it's what I like. Um, see how well it's tasting. So. Uh, if I have a jar that doesn't seal, then then I'll take, I got a plastic uh, caps that you can get at Walmart, little lids you can screw on. I used one of them over there for dipping my vinegar into to wipe the top of my rings. But usually I'll just take, get one of those uh, plastic lids, Take be sure to take the lid, this metal lid off and the ring off because I don't want it to rust and put one of those plastic lids on and put it in the refrigerator. So later on when I want something other or later on for a meal or, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll just take, you know, have some of this and I decided I just want a snack. Well, it's sweet enough for a snack, that's for sure. So, we're almost there. In a minute, we will take the next step of canning. So that's what we're going to wait for. We're going to wait for this little gauge right here to get up to 11 pounds of pressure. So while I'm waiting for the PSI to get where it needs to be, 
I'm already getting the kitchen prepared for the next batch. I've got my jars ready. I got everything ready. Um, my rings ready. Everything is ready. Kitchen kind of gets cleaned up. So that, except that sink right there, it's almost there. But that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm cleaning up the kitchen so that everything in this kitchen is going to flow. I'm not struggling. I'm not looking for something other. This is my vinegar here. I usually I'll put some into a lid like that. I've got everything ready. So while you're waiting, you got your timer going. So you don't forget because you got distracted. You get everything ready for your next batch. Over here, I have kind of dark in here because I've got the lights off. So this is ready. My peelings, my potatoes, my water, my peeler, my knife, everything is ready. Okay, it's reached 11 pounds of pressure. What I'm going to do is stop this timer over here. We'll find my weight. Oh, my weight's on there. Sorry about that. So, the timer, I just cut it off, and uh, it's reached 11 pounds of pressure. I'm going to reach over here. I'm cutting mine down on six. From my experience, six works with my stove. Every stove works differently. Flat top with uh, around four. This one is around six. I'm going to set my timer. These are quartz. And I'm going to set it for 90 minutes. Okay, set at 90 minutes. Um, I'm still going to be watching this gauge. And see how much it climbs. See if it regulates. See if it stays even keel at that weight. I have noticed with sweet potatoes, the temperature has a tendency to rise up. So as it rises up, um, I'm going to cut it down just a little bit. Just a, just a little bit. Just cut it down just a little bit. You want to cut it too low, you cut your pressure down, you have to start all over again. But... Um, so it's your timing, but if it if PSI drops. So I always watch the timer, see where it's standing at, see how many minutes I got, constantly watching this gauge. Um, if it gets, I can tell by knowing this canner, you got to get to know your canner like you got to get to know your stove. I know that when this starts getting to a little bit higher, this jiggler over here will start jiggling. Well, my canner, I, um, uh, I don't have to have it jiggling. What I have to do is make sure this PSI, this pressure here, is uh, for my area and stay regulated. So right now it's staying regulated and uh, I'll just keep watching it. Sometimes you gotta get on top of it. See it, I think I'm gonna cut mine down just, just a tab. In my experience, it's gonna climb. And from my experience, if I do that, it has a tendency to stay there. That's why it's very crucial to, to watch it, to see what it's doing. You don't want to walk away. This is where you want to stand here. So that's what I'm going to do is stand here. So it's been going for 10 minutes and i um, started to peel more potatoes. But still watching this. I did have to cut it down just a tad a little bit more. I mean, it's staying stable. But uh, my experience is it has the tendency to keep rising if I don't do that. But 10 minutes and it's stable. And uh, 11 minutes now. And so all we got to do now is continue to watch this through the time period of the canning process. Make sure that this PSI and once that timer goes off, now all I'll do is put the timer off, cut the heat off, and let it sit there until all the pressure goes down. This PSI that's sitting around at 11, it's gonna go down to zero. And then what I like to do is let it sit there for 10 minutes or so. And uh, don't do anything to it. Just let it sit there for 10 minutes or so. And uh, then I will take the lid off. I've even gone longer on that. It doesn't hurt it at all. But, and then once I take the lid off, I just don't immediately take these jars out because if you got AC into your house, um, you got a temperature flex there. But I like to just take the lid off, uh, set the lid down, let some of that steam still roll out, and uh, maybe about five minutes later, then I'll start taking the jars out. Okay, 
our canner has stopped. That means the process has, is completed. And so now what we're going to do, which I've already done, is take the weight off. The weight is hot, so you got to be careful with it. I'm using this uh, canner that's the N95 All-American. I'm going to untighten these. Sometimes it can be a little tough because there's still a little bit of pressure in there. That's why I like to wait a little bit. Get all that pressure out. So I always say waiting is not going to hurt anything. But for the sake of this video, and I just heard the seal pop. For the sake of this video, I'm going to go ahead and get these out. So I untighten them. And I always just untighten just to the point I can lift them over. Then with this canner, and it's wanting to stick. Now a good rule of thumb is take a little bit of olive oil and run it around your rim. That helps it not to stick. I'm, most of the time I don't have to do that, but when I notice it starts sticking, that's what I'll do with my next canning session. So it still is broke. You see the steam coming out. The worst thing you could do is take and lift this up toward your face because it is hot. So I'm going to lift it away. I'm letting that steam roll out. And I'm going to set this hot lid over here and get it out of the way. Now, for the sake of this video, I like to let these sit here for about at least five minutes or so because you see all that steam that's coming out, the heat's coming out. Of course, we're in the fall. Um, the temperature in my house is probably 80 degrees. So it's uh, not like it would a so we see that our jars are out of the canner now. This one right here is was processed yesterday. And you see that how the potatoes have dropped further down. So we're at the process of cooling canned food. Um, as you take the jars out, you're going to be very careful because they're very hot. Um, to cool the jars, you're going to cool them top side up. Many people will take and put them this part on the bottom, that's not the way to do it. You want to cool the jars top side up. You're giving each jar enough room to let air get in at all sides. So as you see, I've gotten a place where air can get to all sides. Never set a hot jar on a cold surface because it's probably going to bust. Instead, set the jars on a rack or a, um, a folded cloth. This right here is just where I, you would use for to put dishes onto, so it's uh, thick, to absorb water. So you want to keep these uh, hot jars away from drafts, um, but don't slow uh, the cooling uh, by covering them up. You want to keep them open like this. If you find a leaky jar, um, you know, say the next day you, you find a jar that has not sealed, uh, you want to use that jar right away. You want to put it in the refrigerator or you can process it again, but you're going to you remove it from the jar, put new lids, new ring, and you're going to process it as if it is fresh food. So before uh, using jars or lids again, check for defects. Check the lids, check the rings, check the jars, make sure they're not cracked look for defects. When the jars are thoroughly cool, take off the, the screw bands carefully. I usually wait till like the next day, uh, given an expand time of 12 hours. But uh, F, uh, USDA, um, from my old recipe book, uh, says you can take the, the you know, take the bands, um, yeah, the bands off um, as soon as the jar cools. Before you store in your canned food, you're going to wipe the containers clean. Of course, you're going to take the rings off um, because they will rust and you don't want a, um, a false seal. And then you're going to clean these jars up and you're going to wipe uh, the containers clean and you're going to label to show the contents like this. I know it's sweet potatoes, so usually I don't um, put sweet potatoes on there, but you definitely want to put the date and you're going to rotate the oldest date first. If you can more than um, in one day, uh, just be sure to date it.
So you're going to store these um, after you clean them. You're going to store them in a cool, dry place that retains optimal, um, optimal, uh, I would say, airflow, uh, optimal temperature is a better word for better eating quality. So you don't want to use any food that shows any sign of spoilage. Uh, look closely at each container, each jar before opening. Bulging can ends, jar lids, or rings, or a leak. These may mean that the seal has broken and the food has spoiled. And when you open a, a container, look for signs. Uh, look for signs of spurting, spurting, like spurting, like squirting out, or, you know, liquid. Um, that you know it's not normal, a uh, off-scent odor, or mold. You, you want to get rid of that. You just, you know, get, get rid of it. They say to get rid of the jar and everything. But um, definitely get rid of it. You you don't want to take a chance if it doesn't look good, smell good, and taste uh, look good, look good, smell good. Um, the old timers say if it looks good, smells good, and tastes good, then it's good. To avoid you know, any risk of volatilism, everybody knows that's food poison. It's essential that the pressure counter be in perfect order and that every canning recommendation be followed exactly, exactly. So this is raw cold packing. Uh, we have hot packing. We have uh, uh, hot packing, uh, hot packing, and uh, raw packing, and uh, so cold packing. And this is the cold packing method. After the jars sit here and they start sealing, you will hear a pop, a little ping, and you know that your jar has sealed. Now, what I do usually after a couple of hours, um, I will look at my lids right here and see if they have gone down because usually this is kind of rippled up a little bit when it goes down you'll notice the top is flat it's got a like a little addition to it it's not rolled up at you know little addition because this right here in the middle is going to it's going to ping it's going to pop down so i hope that you enjoy this canning session here raw packing cool packing sweet potatoes i hope that you learned something from this video if you did give me a thumbs up give me a thumbs up onto this video aren't they beautiful you see how i just put the look uh the potatoes up about that so far because that liquid does drop that's one of the things you want to remember is that you know don't overpack these jars because it's not going to be able to process correctly it's that the liquid's not going to get where it needs to be and this is how you can sweet potatoes. See you on to the next video. This is Southern Comfort and welcome to my kitchen. You see you on our next stage is just to take these out. And I always hold a rag because of it dripping. The sweet potatoes will eventually fall uh, closer to the bottom. And we'll go over here and lay them where they need to be at.